So this presentation is the same we have at uh, MySQL over, over work. So it was presented by me and David Turner, a colleague of mine. Of course, you can come uh, here, but still, so I can get my slides. So we're going to describe about uh, uh, the way we rolled out Jupyter to Dropbox. The first one of those monthly slides, like for this Dropbox, where this uh, first story is probably most of you already know it. And, uh, we have a lot of technology and that's a really great thing, so if people are interested, just let me know. The, the topics we are trying to cover during this small presentation is our cluster management, what we have at Dropbox, and uh, how we are going to quickly describe how MySQL replication works, and what is the difference between the standard positional replication and the GPT replication. Then we are going to describe how we actually rolled out uh, GPT in, uh, in production and the issue we face during this period the So, uh, the classical MySQL implementation in many of the setup out there is that they just have a single MySQL server, and of course this is a single point of failure, and something that you don't want, to, because if you use the server for whatever reason, you have lost all your data, and you have downtime by the time you recover from, from a backup, or whatever else solution you have. So, one of the common way of solving this issue is to use MySQL replication to allow to spin out. So, you have one master and at least one slave. Okay, this is uh, what we use, although the most common uh, configuration is to have one master and at least two slaves. Here, between you, there are people that in production have hundreds of slaves, maybe even more. So, but, you know, you, you can scale this, this stack as much as you want, so you just put more slaves to the same master. What about Dropbox? Uh, a Dropbox the topology was a bit more complex because we had <coughs> different data centers. For simplicity here, we're just like describing two data centers, one in which we have one master and multiple slaves, therefore simplicity just put one, and we have other data centers in which we have the same setup. You have a master and a slave, but actually the master is not a master per se, but is nothing more than a slave of the original master who is taking the rights. So it is a slave if compared to, to this master, but at the same time is a master to the other slaves in the second data center. So once you know this infrastructure, let's dig a bit more in how uh, replication flows in, uh, in MySQL. So this guy's described it in, uh, in a very uh, quick way. So the client sends data to, to the MySQL server, that is the master, the master generates his own binary logs, that is the representation of the events, then uh, of the data that has been changed. The binary logs is being processed by a thread called the bin log dump threads, and this thread is responsible to send the data to the slaves. On the slave side, things are a bit uh, complicated, but let's just try to simplify them, saying that there is an IO thread that is responsible for all the network IO, and this IO threads drive those events into a relay log, a series of relay log. And those relay logs are being read by the slave SQL threads that read those events from the relay log and apply them in, uh, in the server. And the server then generates its own binary logs. So as you can understand from here, the binary logs is at the very heart of the MySQL replication. They're extremely important and without the MySQL uh, bin log, the replication is not possible. How do MySQL binary log, logs looks like in the days? Well, we're not going to describe exactly how uh, they are in general, the MySQL bin log, what is the format, but let's just say that uh, we refer to them using a file name and a position. So in this case, this is MySQL bin log 0073, and it has a position that is so at that specific position there is a replication element. Uh, in the next slide, uh, I don't have space to write all the file name and the position, so I'm going to summarize them in this sort of format. So, MB73 means binary logs, number 73, position 30. So, how do looks like a replication flow? So, you have a master, and the master has his own binary logs, like, for example, uh, bin log 7, position 300, and then file 7, position 350, and so on. But those by log name and position, they are not the same on the slaves. The reason why they're not the same on the slave, it might be a variety of reasons. Like, for instance, uh, the slave was created at the later stage, so it starts with numbering from, uh, from a different position than the master, or, for instance, you have restarted the slave multiple times, so every time you start to generate new binary logs. 
Or another example, you might have the bill of file size of the slave that is different than the one the one on the master, so they rotate in a different way. <coughs> so when you're trying to build replication using trying to match what is the binary log on the one event in the binary log of the master with one event in the binary log of the slaves, something's quite complicated than a bit articulated in there. So it is, it is possible, it's a solution that works for many years and uh, you, you can still work with it, but this it, it makes things complicated, uh, especially if you have a replication topology in which you have one master replicating two slaves and then this slave is the master of another one. Because <coughs> what's happened is that each of those servers has its own different file name and position for the same element. And the problem in this setup is what happens if, for whatever reason, the server in the middle of this chain goes away? If the server goes away, you are losing those information, so you don't know from which position you have to start the application uh, from that slave to connect to the master. It's still possible, you can analyze the binary logs and identify uh, what are the transactions that are being exhibited on the slave, but this is something not, not trivial, and uh, it might take some time also to automate it. So here is where JDID can and play a very important role. So how it looks a global transaction read with JDID? Well, it looks like this long strings. That is nothing more than piece of information that is divided in two parts. The first part is the source ID. So this long string is nothing more than the representation of the server that generated the dialog event. And then you have a transaction ID that is nothing more than an incremental, uh, than an incremental ID. An important thing to understand here is that this information um, identifies one transaction and this is uh, consistent across all the servers. So if on any server you look for this specific global transaction ID, that it will have exactly the same information. So if you use global transaction ID to set up replication, it makes things a lot easier because you don't have to deal anymore with file name, offset, the whole concept of file name and concept and byte offset is completely gone, making things a lot easier. In fact, going back to the example we had before, uh, the master in this case is generating a uh, bin of events and you don't care anymore what is the file name and the position inside, but all, you, all we need to know is the transact global transaction ID. So in this case is source ID number seven, I'm simplifying, and the ID is that you then same uh, source ID, 51, and 52 as transaction ID. In the slave, instead, we, well, in this case, the slave is one transaction behind, actually two transactions behind, so because it's, it's possible to have some replication lag. So uh, in this case, the slave is writing on its own binary log. Uh, the transaction ID is 7, 28, 29, 30, and so on. <coughs> and at the same time, the last server is slightly behind of the second server. So this position is, is a bit different. So what happened in this setup if we lose the server in the middle? So we lose again all this information. Although it's not a problem because now we know that this, the slaves, the last slaves, the last transaction ID that it wrote in its own binary logs is the one that has source ID number seven and transaction, and transaction ID number 28, 29. So what we need to do is to start verification starting from uh, 7 and 30. So what we need to do is just to connect this slave to the master and it will automatically resume replication from, from the right position. So this is a very interesting feature for JDID and is one of the main reasons we, we start implementing JDID. So <coughs> there is very quite big list of features that are with, with JDID, that JDID allow, but probably the most important for us the way it goes, listed here. So uh, this simplifies a lot the, the failover process, especially if it was, I mean, normally if it was a plant failover or, uh, or an unplanned failover. In fact, uh, using cheated, with, sorry, without using cheated, one of the issues is that you always have to have the slave in sync with the master before doing the promotion. Well, this is not always the case, but to simplify things, it was better to have the slaves in sync with the master. With JDID, this is not the case anymore because you can just perform a failover and <coughs> you can start the replication from uh, knowing from which JDID you have to start. 
and it also makes things easier because in, in case the master that has cars come back online, I don't know exactly where it stopped and we can put it back in the replication topology. So because of those features, it's allowed to build very complex uh, replication topology. And it also improves the backup and the recovery in the recovery. And we're going to show more slides about this. So, uh, how we do promotion before CD? Well, first of all, as I was saying, the first way that the slaves are consigned to the master, uh, and then you promote uh, one slave to become the new master, then on this server, you run show master status, you see who is the current final position, and then on each slave, you run a change master to specifying the host name, username, and password, and then passing to extra parameters that are the master log file and the master log position. So those were the output coming from show master status. With GTIP, instead, it's absolutely way easier because all you have to do is, you don't need to execute any command on the master, but on the slave you have to execute the change master too. Again, you have to pass host name, username, and password, and then you just specify master of the position on top. And it will resume the application from the right position. So, also, why it simplify uh, the backup and the recovery? Well, one of the problems with, um, <coughs> with positional replication is that if you take a backup from a slave, in the, slave in, in the backup itself you have binary log position of the slaves, and also you have information about replication, uh, the replication position uh, of when the backup was taken. So, what happens if you try if you have also a parental backup, where well, you are taking parental backup from the same server. And that's fine because you know <coughs> which was the last binary log from the slave and just taking parental backup starting from the next file. <coughs> what what happened is if you want to recover uh, this backup and you only have the two backup and you want to apply binary log from a different from the parent server. Well this was was impossible because there is most no correlation between the incremental backup taken in one server and the two backup mm -hmm. taken in the other one. At the same time, another problem that you can have is that a backup taken from a slave become almost useless if there was a master failover because you are losing the replication position because, of course, the master is not there anymore. So um, if a failover happens, the backup is almost useless. Well, with GDIP, these things is absolutely, uh, all those issues are solved because um, you can restore a backup from any server and start applying final log data from another server. All you need is the uh, GDIP position and, and then you start applying uh, incremental backup starting from there. So how do we enable GDIP? Well, it's quite straightforward to be honest. Uh, the variables you need are quite simple. So log bin is you need final log enabled, which is obvious. We have them also without GTIP. Then log slave update, this was monitored in 5.6. And probably if you have a replication topology, you already have log slaves update in, uh, enabled in all the servers. What this variable means basically is that a slave does not just write in, in his binary log at the statement or the changes that have been executed on the slaves on the server, but also the one coming from the master. And then there are other two variables, which is GTIP mod equal one, that basically means nothing more than enable GTIP. And then there is enforce GDIP consistency. Uh, a quick slide about what enforce GDIP consistency means is that the server that has GDIP enforce enabled can only execute a statement that are safe in a transactional method. So this means that you cannot run queries like this one, uh, like a create from a create table from a select, or a create temporary table within a transaction, or have a transaction that makes transaction and not transaction data because it's not transactional state. So how do you roll out GDP? Those are the steps. Uh, you can have some optimization like you can configure GDP before proceeding with everything else, but in a nutshell, this is it. So you first set with only equal uh, one the master, so it means you're blocking the virus in the master. Then you shut down the server, you enable GTIP across all the servers. You start again the master, but again with read only one to prevent writes to the server. 
and so you know, nothing goes on the binary logs. And then you start for the slaves with skip slaves start. That again means do not start the application. The reason behind this is that you need to run change master with master of the position equal one. Let's start replication using start replication using uh, GDIP. Then you start the slaves, and so replication will start with GDIP, and then you reset, you re-enable the price of the master and um, replication will work. The problem here is that you don't want to shut down the server at the same time. That's, that, I mean, it doesn't matter how big is the infrastructure, if it is uh, a small one or a big one, you don't want to have such a big downtime like shutting down all the servers. So we need to we need a way to uh, roll out GDIP uh, in, uh, in an online fashion. And this was a quite community effort because there were some patches available from both from Facebook and uh, from Booking. We had Bitcoin that ported the Facebook patch into the Bitcoin server, and they also introduced a new variable that is the GDIP deployment step. When this variable is set to is, is enabled, what it does is that the server understands GDIP to the application, but it writes its own binary log event without without GDIP. So how we roll it out? Well, we start we start with the state with GDIP enabled and GDIP deployment step equal. On. So this means that the slave were, were able to understand GDP even if the master was still sending a uh, replication event using uh, position. Then you perform a promotion. So one, uh, the master is being demoted and one of the slaves who has already GDP enabled become the new master. Although the master is still writing binary log event without GDP because of this variable set to, set to is enabled. Then you disable the you disable the variable and the master automatically will start writing binary log event using GDIP. Well, what will happen is that all the slaves will start receiving event in GDIP with the exception of the old master because it doesn't have GDIP enabled. So you can choose what to do with the old master. You either just remove it from the replication or you just upgrade it to using GDIP. Okay, uh, before going into production with GDIP, we had you know, we had a lot of research about it, we had a lot of testing, we spoke with ex-colleagues and other people working in different companies and how, uh, what were the problems that they encountered when when, uh, when they started using GDIP. So we were already prepared about a lot of edge case. Of course, when we deployed it, there were still a few more edge cases that we hit. Unfortunately, we were, not, we were not expecting them. One of them is we had a lot of zombie states so what was happening is that when um, we were running show processes, we were seeing that the same server, was same slave was connected to the master multiple times, but in reality, this, the master was not sending any binary log ever to the slaves, and we were noticing that all the time the slave was connecting again to the master, creating a new connection, and on the master there was another zombie threat that was, that was there. The problem was that it was a combination of issues, actually. So when you have GD enabled, the master needs to find in his own binary logs what, where this GD stuck. So that you need to scan the binary log and, and find the GD event. The, the other issue we had was that the slave was configured with a very small slave name timeout. So the slave was connecting to the master. And if the master was not sending any event within two minutes, it was another case. The slave was thinking the master was gone, so the slave was reconnecting while the master was still trying to find the, the event to send to the slaves. And I'm going very quickly because we have one minute. Uh, so we had other issues. Uh, very good things about uh, GDIP is that you can identify if there are some uh, event directs hit on the slave but not on the master using GDIP set. And this is good, but at the same time, we had some edge case in which we were seeing things like. Transaction being executed on the slave, while we were sure there was there was no this the case, and the problem was with memory table. We had some legacy application, and every time we start my SQL, there is a memory table we just pay the transaction to clean the tables. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Another issue we had was this one. So basically. <coughs> We were having replication, and the replication in short state cycles, you have information about the GDIP set you were executed in the feed. And we had that case, uh, several cases, in which 
uh, the slave was reporting that he never received some uh, jitter from the master, but it has executed it. And of course, this makes no sense. And we were analyzing the value log of the slaves and the events were there, so I guess it means it has executed them. We also had some tools that were all done checking data consistency, so we know that there was no data consistency logger at it. So uh, then we figured out that to also to the power they had a lot that was an accounting problem. So basically this the slave was losing track of what has received from from the master. Um, well, I think that's that. This was another you know, issue. Um, when you have cheated and multiple uh, multiple threads slaves, uh, we were facing issue in which there were gaps in the cheated executed. The reason being is that when one worker was slower than the other, um, for a certain period of time, some cheated was was missing the cheated executed set. But of course, within fraction of a second, it was was coming. The gap was disappearing. Okay, that's all.